I, let me begin by apologizing because I do not speak Spanish. Um, I'm going to talk today on a couple of topics. One will be uh, anomalous dispersion and diffusion. If you're involved with forest media or almost any branch of physics these days, you'll see it coming up. And I'll speak very briefly on some work we're doing on swelling forest media, which, are, which is actually a fairly complicated uh, topic. And let me also give credit where credit is due. The students that I've, these are all, all the names below me here are former students of mine. Uh, Dan O'Malley, who's now at Los, An Los Alamos Na National Laboratory. Mungi Park, Alabama Huntsville. Natalie Quantle O'Malley was at Brown University before she was. Monica Moroni at the University of Rome. Bill Stroud is in industry. And Martin Schoen is now the head of theoretical chemistry at Berlin Technical. So they're from quite different backgrounds, and they're scattered all over the place. But they all played a role in what I'm about to talk about. Do most of you know what anomalous dis dispersion is? Or have you ever heard of the term anomalous dispersion? Uh, anomalous dispersive processes are, are processes where the mean square displacement of a particle, that's basically the, the distance a particle is traveling, not squared, right? If it grows linearly in time, that's a classical, that's what people call classical dispersion or classical diffusion. I'm going to show you in a minute that that, that need not be classical at all, but I'll get to that in a second. And people then would say uh, it's anomalous if the mean square displacement grows as t to some power other than 1. That's, this is a Lagrangian picture, so I'm looking at particles as they, as they separate from one another. If you looked at it from an Eulerian perspective, anomalous dispersion would be one where, for example, the diffusion coefficient depended on time rather than being a constant or the equations themselves might be non-local in space and time. That would all, those would all be classified as, as anomalous processes. Most, most often in, in the physics community, if you look at an anomalous process, what they say is the mean square displacement uh, is nonlinear. Right? It, does not, it doesn't, doesn't go linearly in time. And so what we have to ask, is that a reasonable criteria for something to be anomalous? And what I'm going to argue in a minute, it is, it is not a very good criteria at all. So if beta is less than 1, the beta up here, if that's less than 1, the process is said to be subdiffusive. If it's bigger than 1, it's said to be superdiffusive. Okay, and sub and superdiffusive processes actually turn out to be the rule rather than the exception. Historically, what people have said is that anomalous dispersion arises because of a breakdown in the central limit theorem. Why is the central limit theorem important for diffusion or dispersion? It's because you have steps that go in increments. And if you add up all the increments, basically you get the path of the process, right? So you're adding up random variables. So the central limit theorem is going to come into play. There was a very famous paper. It's been cited over 3,000 times uh, in physics reports uh, by Metzger and Clavster, who are two very bright and talented individuals, but they make a very big mistake. They, they have made this statement, which I think they actually got from somebody else, that a power law mean square displacement is intimately connected with a breakdown in the central limit theorem caused by either broad distributions. In other words, if you look at the transition density, it has very large, like a power law scaling out the ends, <coughs> or by uh, long range correlations. Okay? That turns out not to be the case at all. And it's very easy to show that. And a simple counterexample is Brownian motion, but I'm going to play a trick with Brownian motion. I'm going to change the clock. So I'm going to run Brownian motion with a nonlinear clock. Basically, I replace t in Brownian motion with some nonlinear function of t. Okay, and that's perfectly leg legitimate to do that. This process has increments that are normal, mean zero, and variance h of t minus h of s. And the importance here is that h of t minus h of s unless h is linear is a nonlinear function. So this is going to be, this is going to have non-stationary increments. All right, and that's the key. It has non-stationary increments. Uh, the classical, if you, if, you, if you do a random walk that represents a Brownian process, all right, so you take these steps, and the steps have some normal distribution looking like this, and you add up all these steps, you do, there is a central limit theorem that applies to those. Okay, so you don't have long-range correlations, and, uh, but you do have non-stationary increments. This process can have any mean square displacement that you want. You just, it, it will have 
a mean square displacement that will go t to the beta just by choosing h as t to the beta. That's all I have to do. So the central limit theorem applies to that random walk, but yet I have anomalous dispersion. All right? So that contradicts what that last statement was that's been cited over 3,000 3, times. Now, it's actually very frustrating to see something in the literature that's cited over and over and over and over and over again, and it's absolutely false, but that, is, that statement is false. What makes this counterexample to that statement, the original statement about the central limit theorem, what, what makes it fall apart is this thing right here, non-stationary increments. Right? People are used to talking about processes that have stationary increments. <clears throat> but what, what, what you can find out if you study enough about these sort of systems is that non-stationary increments are the rule. Stationary increments are a very unusual thing. The mathemat mathematicians would say in the right spaces, the process of the stationary increments are what we would call nowhere dense. Right? That means there are very few of them. To actually find a process with stationary increments is an accident, accident almost. OK, two, two important questions that are rarely posed. Mathematically, why does a diffusive or dispersive process uh, display anomalous, anomalous behavior? Why does it do that? And is the mean square displacement adequate to classify diffusion or dispersion? And I will answer these uh, questions in a few minutes. Diffusion equations for anomalous processes are most often non-local, sometimes in space, sometimes in time, sometimes in space and time. By non-local, I mean instead of just having a partial differential equation, like the diffusion, classical diffusion equation, a non-local process has integrals in it, integrals over time, possibly integrals over space. And this is a very general example of a diffusion equation that the solution to which behaves nothing like a Brownian motion. This we actually derived back in the mid-90s. A colleague of mine by the name of Shlomo Neumann derived exactly the same thing at the same time by completely different methods. Okay, this is a very general diffusion equation. If you've heard of the continuous time ran, not the continu yeah, the continuous time random walk method that people are using and applying nowadays all over the place, their uh, master equation is precisely this equation. Right? So what people are doing now with continuous time random walk is using a master equation that was actually derived 10 years before they derived it for the CTRW. I'm going to give you some examples of anomalous processes. This is a, a simulation we did back in around 2000, 2001. It's actually on the cover of a, a journal called Limeir, which is the main college chemistry journal for the uh, college chemists. And what you're looking at here is what people call capillary snap-off. Right? So I've, I've got two surfaces, and I bring them together. And there's a fluid between them. And now I start to pull the surfaces apart. And you see this meniscus forming on the edge. And they pull hard enough and long enough, eventually it snaps off. Uh, so that's called capillary snap off. What's interesting about this uh, diagram, as far as diffusion is concerned, is that, let me, well, let me, let me explain what's going on here. This is the surface, that's the surface. The reddish colors are a high probability of finding a, a molecule there. The black means is basically a vacuous area right there. Blue is less than, is very much less than, green is somewhere in between. And what you see is as the fluid condenses between these two surfaces, it doesn't look like a normal fluid. Right? This is a very structured creature here between these two surfaces. This is what people nowadays would call a nano film. And it's extremely structured until I get the surfaces far apart where it becomes diffused and diffused. And then you see that snap and snap off right there. And as I bring the surfaces down again, you see the fluid condense. It condenses into layers. Right? And the layers have structure. And at certain separations, if you choose the separations correctly, what you'll see in a minute is everything's going to go black around here. This is the vapor phase. This is the liquid phase with order. When all this goes black right there, right, right there, that's a solid. So even though I've got a vapor phase in equilibrium with this pore phase, Right? I can exist as a liquid, a vapor, or a solid between those two surfaces if I have the appropriate epitaxy of alignment of the surfaces with the fluid. So what does that have to do with diffusion? <coughs> when you bring these two surfaces close enough, it freezes into a solid, okay? Monolayer solid. If I now were to shift this way a little bit, I can liquefy the system. Right? And I keep on going and it solidifies and liquefies and solidifies. 
if you look at the fusion in that monolayer, that the fusion in the monolayer is non-Brownian. And that's what the next slide will show you. This is actually a, this is a computational statistical mechanical simulation done in what's called an isostress, isostrain, grand canonical. I've put together a cartoon here to kind of depict what's going on when I have a monolayer. If you think of this line here as an active potential surface, okay, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an active potential for the atoms on the surface of one surface, or one of the solid pieces. This is an active potential on the other piece of material, right, and the fluid resides between those two surfaces. And if the surfaces are perfectly in alignment, so I've got an atom right here, an atom right there, an atom right there, an atom right there, what happens is the fluid gets trapped in here, and it just sits there and oscillates around, okay? And it doesn't move anywhere except for in that local little pocket right here. If I now change the registry slightly, then the fluid can start hopping over these energies. It can't hop over the energy barrier here because it's too strong, but here, the energy barriers to, to movement, translational movement, are being reduced. All right, so now I start to see hopping, and the fluid atoms will now start to move from here to here to here. And if you look at it properly, that's a porous medium problem, right? Because what you've got right in here is just essentially a porous medium, cell to channel to cell to channel. If I get them completely out of registry, so here's an atom, there's an atom, there's an atom, then the fluid in here can go very easily over this energy barrier here. Now, if you look at the fusion in this process, in this in this system, here you're going to get something of the mean square displacement looks like t to the one. All right, you have classical Brownian fusion in here. If you look at it in here, you get subdiffusion. You get mean square displacement looks like t to the beta, where beta is like 0.6. Okay, you have subdiffusion. And then here you have no no diffusion, right? Because it's solid. So there's an example of anomalous diffusion and subdiffusion. This is another, this is an experiment. By the way, the last simulation was mainly done with Martin Schoen in, in Germany. This is a, an experiment run at the University of Rome. And what we've got is a, is a porous box made of Pyrex beads. Okay, and the Pyrex beads are bathed in glycerol. And if you raise glycerol to the right temperature, the pyrex beads and glycerol have exactly the same index of refraction. What does that mean? I can pass light through there and I never see the solid phase. That's really a cool system, right? You can think of the glycerol as being a cloaking device for the pyrex beads if you want. Because at the right temperature, the pyrex becomes invisible. Right? And all you see the whole system is transparent. You see right through it. Now if I put a bunch of bubbles in there and I start a flow field, the bubbles, you can see, why can you see the bubbles, air bubbles? Because air has a different refractive index than, uh, the, than the pyrex and the glycerol, so it reflects light. So you can see the bubbles. And what you're seeing here is an image or, of, of the very centers of bubbles as they, as they move along down through this box full of beads. Okay? And Monica can image up to 40. This is really impressive because she can image up to 40,000. This is Monica Moroni at the University of Rome. can image 40,000 beads at one time, bubbles in this an incitation, this is like one camera would be facing this way, another camera would be perpendicular to, to it this way, so you're looking at uh, basically projections in opposite, in opposite directions. And what she does then is stereographically reconstruct these into a three-dimensional trajectory. So you can actually get three-dimensional trajectories inside this porous body. And that means you can examine the fusion, right? Because I can follow these particles along, I can look at the mean square displacement. This is just a snapshot of what you see if you put the whole system back together in three dimensions, right? You can see these, and this is, so here I am in three space, and these, oh, it's really a tangled mess here because there's so many, just 40, like I said, it's 40,000 particles here. These are just the tra trajectories of those particles. But if I have the trajectory as a function of time, then I can get a mean square displacement statistically. I have 40,000 trajectories here to play with. I can get the mean square displacement and I can test to see whether or not it has a power law distribution. And what you find is on a very short time, it does look like a power law, but as you go a little longer, it turns to the, the power goes to one. So it's initially anomalous and then it transitions into a classical process. These are, uh, these are movies from a colleague of mine. I 
It was on sabbatical at Harvard a few years back. And these were movies made by uh, Howard Berg, who's in physics and molecular biology at Harvard. And what you're looking at here is microbes swimming. Right? And, the, and the little tails that you're seeing here or their trajectories, we're, we're actually imaging parts of the microbes, so you can actually follow different parts of the microbe. These microbes exercise a really beautiful, simple, and simple process. They look like, if you look at them carefully enough, they look like uh, alpha-stable levy motion. Alpha-stable levy motions are a cool process because if you look at the diffusion equation, it's a fractional equation. And that's, that's the kind of trajectory that these guys actually follow. That's an anomalous process as well. You have an infinite mean square displacement. If you actually followed one of those trajectories, it would look something like these paths. Uh, alpha stable levy paths are cool because they're fractals. Right? No matter what size a picture I take of this creature, it's always going to look the same. Right? It's self-similar. But that's what those trajectories of those micros follow. And that's also, this is also an anomalous process. And this is what I was saying, the levy motion. If you look at the diffusion equation, it looks something like this, but instead of having classical second order derivatives there, you've got fractional derivatives. The fractional derivative, if you know what that is, is nothing but an integral. So this is an integral partial differential equation, much in the way that first equation I gave you earlier was. In fact, you can put this in exactly that form. Here's another example. You can think of this as being a pore in a porous media. This is another one done at the University of Rome, where in this case, Monica put uh, some pollen particles in water and then started a flow field through the system and then mapped the trajectories. And you see all kinds of interesting things happening in here. You see the leddies developing up here and down here and up here, the little eddy developing. And then you have this, this stuff in the middle that just sort of flows freely along. Periodically, a particle in here will hop up to there, and a period particle in here will hop back up to there. So you can see how dispersion in a porous media can be extremely complicated. This is just a single pore. Right? Now imagine thousands of torturous pores all over the place. And so without even any absorption at all to the walls, I'm getting really bizarre behavior inside this pore. I'm getting slowed down regions, speeded up regions. <clears throat> so that leads to heavy tails in general. Okay, and heavy tails means it's anomalous. You're not going to have a mean square displacement that looks like time to the one power. And this one actually turns out to look like, although I don't have a slide for it, fractional Brownian motion run with a nonlinear clock. And like I say, you get these different you get these little vortices that develop up here down here and up there and then the main passage through the system. It's a the process will behave anomalously. And like I say, it's, when it's a fractional Brownian motion uh, run with a nonlinear clock. So I won't explain what it is then, because it'll take a little time. Um, it's, a, it's an unusual process because it has correlated increments. Stationary increments, but they're correlated. And fractional Brownian motion is nice because the fractal dimension of all the paths are known by what's called the Hurst exponent. So this is, this is the formal definition of a fractional Brownian motion not really that important for what we're doing. Um, and if you run it with a nonlinear clock, you can do a lot of cool things as far as mean square displacement is concerned. I can have a mean square displacement to t to any power I want. In fact, I can have mean square displacement t to the one power. Okay, well, what's wrong with that picture? If I got a linear mean square displacement, normally people would say, ha-ha, I got Brownian motion. But fractional Brownian motion is nothing like Brownian motion. And if you run it with a nonlinear clock, it's really nothing like a Brownian motion. It has non-stationary in increments, and it has correlated increments. Brownian motion has stationary increments and uncorrelated increments. But yet it has mean square displacement, if I set it up properly, with one. That's starting to say, oh, well, classification based on mean square displacement is not going to make a whole lot of sense. Right? Because I can get a mean square displacement of one and have a process that looks nothing like Brownian motion. In fact, I can make the fractal dimension arbitrary for fractional Brownian motion. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, whereas classical Brownian motion has a fractal dimension always fixed at one half. This fractional does not. 
As a side note, I'm generating random fields here. And guess how I'm generating these random fields? This is people in stochastic hydrology, for example, use random fields all the time for various things. You're using them right now. These random fields are generated from fractional Brownian motion run with the nonlinear clock. And it, it's cool because I can do all kinds of strange things with this process, but guess what? Every one of these things, no matter how, see how different they look? They all have the same fractal dimension. That's a little bizarre if you think about it. Here's the same sort of thing with a different fractal dimension. But again, this is a fractional Brownian motion run with a different nonlinear clocks. In this case, one clock is in radial coordinates. That's the classical fractional Brownian motion. Here's a, here's a fractional Brownian motion run with a squared clock, and here's one with a, with a 0.5 clock. You get all kinds of different behaviors, but they all have the same fractal dimension. And there are all kinds of people running around saying, I'm going to go out, going to, go out to the field, and I'm going to measure the fractal dimension, and that's going to tell me something about the flow field. I say, nonsense. Because each one of these has the same fractal dimension. If you think of these as conductivity fields, they're going to be wildly different in their behavior when you look at the flow problem or the transport problem. And this is using the same sort of idea to generate terrain. This is kind of a cool little exercise. This is a fractional Brownian motion with this very funny clock up here. Okay. Here I've generated, using, that, using this motion, I've generated a mountain range. Right. And I can move peaks around and slopes around, all kinds of things, by just changing my, my clock here on this fractional Brownian motion. So people that do deal with geomorphology and related fields can actually use these fractional Brownian motions run with these nonlinear clocks, which are anomalous, to generate topography. And that's a very, this is a lake in here, and they get clouds up there, and mountains. It looks real. I mean, you can, it really looks real. It's not, but it looks, it looks real. All right, so the question I'm going to pose is, what is the origin of the power law of mean square displacement? And I'm just going to give you the answer rather than the argument. The essential problem with classifying diffusive processes based on their mean square displacement is that this statistic does not provide enough information to distinguish between diffusive processes that are widely different. Widely different. Two simple examples will illustrate the problem. I've talked about one of them already. One involves a process that comes to a stop in a long time limit, but has infinite mean square displacement. Right, infinite mean square displacement, most people would think that thing is moving very rapidly, right? like a, like a classical alpha stable levy motion does. You have big jumps periodically. And the other is concerned with a non-Brownian process that has mean square displacement one. If you take a, an alpha stable levy motion, Right, an alpha stable levy motion is kind of a cool process because it has these big jumps periodically interspersed with a bunch of little jumps. So I jump around a little bit, and also I have a big jump. Then I jump around a little bit again, and I have another big jump. Okay, if you run, and, and that's going to make you think, and everybody has always always thought that that process is going to diffuse rapidly. It's super diffusive, and it is classical alpha stable levy motion is super diffusive. But guess what? If you put the right clock in there, right? in other words, you just change the time to some other funny time, guess what happened? It stops. Dead stops. So even though I've got infinite second moment, right, the process comes to a screeching halt. And the different alphas, they just say you have a different fractal dimension, basically, in the system. That's the alpha stable levy process. So here's a process that comes to a screeching halt. It's made up of levy motion run with a funny clock. That's, that just sounds weird if you think about it. An alpha stable levy motion that comes to a halt. It's super diffusive, but it comes to a halt. And then there's the linear mean square displacement one, which is the fractional Brownian motion run with a nonlinear clock. And here's, here's, here's an example. Each one of these realizations of a trajectory has a different fractal dimension, widely different fractal dimension. But guess what their mean square displacements are? T to the one power. So if I, if I was an experimentalist and I came out and I made a measurement and I saw all mean square displacement t to the 1, I'd say classical process, Brownian motion, right? Brownian motion has a fixed fractal dimension. Each one of these has a different fractal dimension. But each one of those has linear mean square displacement. So the whole idea of classifying anomalous processes with the mean square displacement is just bogus, I mean, really bogus. We use something called uh, renormalization group arguments to try and classify um, 
anomalous process. And then actually the renormalization group method works extremely well. You can classify any process you want to with, the re re with a renormalization group type algorithm. And we're using a very simple renormalization group. One group is for long time and one group is for short time. This operator acting on my process just does this to it. It, takes <coughs> it, it stretches time and then it shifts the distance, basically. That's a renormalization group. It's a group. If you look at the, the properties of, that, R, R, of this operator, R has properties of a group. This would be a long time renormalization group. This is just the same thing, but the short time renormalization group. Um, these guys can be used to actually classify processes. Every self similar process immediately can be classified by these. And the self similar processes are processes like Brownian motion, fractional Brownian motion, alpha stable levy motion, fractional levy motion. Those are all self -similar, self similar processes. They can be classified very simply with this process. This is, an, this is a geophysical example. We've got a stochastic process X of T that satisfies a stochastic differential equation that looks like that. Okay, that's just a classical stochastic differential equation that can rec represent flows in force media. Or I'm going to assume that this A of X of T, and you can think of A as the velocity, if you will. Uh, square root of D, D being the diffusion coefficient, B being a Brownian motion. This stochastic differential equation, I'm going to assume that A is a velocity field that's continuous on the short time scale, ergodic on the long time scale. This would be something like getting into Gaon and Aldo Fiori would play with in the stochastic hydrology, hydrology field. And DB is a standard Brownian motion. This is an interesting process because it's a realistic geophysical transport process. But if you looked at the classification of it, what you'd find out is that uh, the, normal um, the normal parts of this thing is it's subdiffusive on the short time scale and classical diffusive on the long time scale. That's, that's the key. And that can all be that all follows from uh, the renormalization group algorithm, which I'm not going to spend any time talking about. Favorite slides, fractal smactal. And I say fractal smactal because there are so many people out there going around talking about the fractal nature of the universe, basically. And I'm saying the fractal dimension tells you very little about what's going on in the system. And that's my counterexample will show that. And the other is geostatistics equal wishful thinking. Why do I say geostatistics equals wishful thinking? Because the ability to find a process that has stationary increments is almost non-existent. I mean, they just don't exist in reality. They, like they have what people would say is a set of measure zero. So everybody's running around doing geostatistics. They all assume stationary increments, or almost everybody assumes stationary increments. Not everybody. And I'm saying the fact for you to actually find a process out there that has stationary increments is going to be awfully lucky. All right? So that's why I say wishful thinking. There's a whole sequence of literature on this stuff over the last decade or so. Most of it actually is in the physics literature. Some is in the hydrology literature. Some is in the chemistry literature. And now since it, I was announced that way, I'm going to change subjects a little bit and talk about swelling media. Completely different topic. Um, we've been, for the last, since the mid, early 90s, we've been working with swelling porous media. Swelling porous media, think of a montmorillonite clay, bacteria clay. Right? Those are good examples of swelling porous media. The biological tissues are also swelling. Many biological tissues are swelling porous media. Right? Think of drying out your skin. What happens? It shrinks. Swelling media. Your discs in the back of your neck, swelling media. You your brain, people have problems when they get hit on the head and their brain swells. That's all swelling media. So this, what I'm talking about, applies to all these areas. A, a kernel of corn, when you dry it out, it shrinks. You, you bake a lo loaf of bread, what happens? <coughs> it expands, right? And then the crust forms on it. Shrinking, swelling problem. Those are all examples of swelling force media. So swelling force media show up all over the place. Another common area that people don't think too much about unless you're in uh, biomedical engineering is drug delivery systems, pills that you take. Right? Many of those pills are swelling porous media because because what you want to do is allow the chemical that's inside of the pill to be released slowly. So what happens is the pills gradually expand when they get wet when you put them in your mouth. Right? And when they gradually expand, the pores get bigger, and the chemical, the the, the thing you 
want to take to fix whatever's wrong with you starts to diffuse out. And you can control the way it diffuses out by controlling the way that system swells. So that's called controlled delivery. There's a whole branch of drug delivery. It's called controlled deli delivery. That's just swelling force me. It's a swelling force me. And like I say, we've been playing with this for umpteen million years. Um, this is just a few numerical simulations that one of my recent students has been doing, uh, Ben Bartel. And we're using commercial software to do this. But it takes a lot of work to be able to use the commercial stuff because it's not defined, not designed to do non-local processes in general. Swelling is a non-local process. So I'm going to work with several different examples of swelling force mediums. So I've got different geometries like circles, squares, and things like that. I'm going to let them swell and shrink based on the proper physics for the underlying problem. For the simplest case that I'm going to talk about here, all I'm going to talk about here, the Balance law for the fluid phase looks like this. It has an integral on time, and that's a killer when you do things numerically. But I can still do this. I mean, we're going to solve this on COMSOL. Reasonably complicated equation, but this is the simplest model there is, basically, for swelling force media. It's not local in time. It looks like a viscoelastic body. All right, and this is, this is just an, an example of what happens. If I start out with the system and say initially completely saturated, which you've got a very poor porosity, completely saturated initially, and I let it dry out, these are just the moisture curves, what happens is you have to start shifting because as the system is drying, it's becoming smaller. Right? And then each one of these is progressively um, <coughs> more dry. And I'm going to illustrate this with a lot more detail with some good examples. Here's an example of a problem where you're wetting up a body, oops, excuse me, drying a body. Each one of these time intervals is a later time. I start out with my initial body like that. I don't know why it does that. Starts out here, it starts to shrink, and as it shrinks, the moisture content is changing too. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Here's an expansion problem. Well, I take that back. On this. A shrinkage problem again, where I initially have a fairly moist sphere, and now I start to let it dry out. The colors are just representing the different moisture contents in the system. See how it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. This is a shrinkage problem. This is what happens to a. This one actually was a is a model of a, is a of a soybean. When you take and dry a soybean out. As you, as you dehydrate the moisture from it, the, the bean gets smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually it'll start cracking. And that's another very interesting problem related to swelling porous media, the idea of fracturing. You've all, you've all seen a field where if it's gotten completely saturated and then the sun comes out and bakes it, what happens to the surface if it's bare? You get all these little tessellations and cracks forming little chunks, right? All that's doing is that's a swelling problem. In this case, it's shrinking. Right? The, the, the soil on the surface is shrinking. It gets to a critical point where the, you can't support the stresses due to the shrinkage anymore. And that's when, that's when the cracks form. And so you get all these little blocky structures all over the field. That's exactly what that is. That's a swelling porous media problem. This one's kind of interesting because I've got the top being one conductivity and the bottom being a different conductivity. And now I'm going to um, let it expand, I guess, in this case. And so you get asymmetry in the expansion. It's expanding a lot on the bottom and a lot less so on the top, even though it's got the same boundary condition all the way around it. This is a, this is a drug delivery type problem. Okay? I put one chemical on one side. I put a different chemical on the other side. One's going to get out faster because the pores on that side are going to get big fast. Right? The other side's going to stay small, so its pores are going to release the, the chemical much more slowly. So I can have chemicals, com chemicals coming out of this forced body at two different speeds. Right? That's important from a drug, drug perspective. And this is the same thing, but a better picture of it. Now I'm expanding, so I'm vibing a fluid. The top has got one conductivity. The bottom has got a different conductivity. The bottom vibes fluid much faster, so it expands much faster than the top does. And again, that's of relevance to drug delivery. And I don't think these are going to work. But I, we were doing the same thing with these rectangles. And they give actually a very nice video. But I, I think on this machine, they don't work. I tried them a minute ago, and they aren't working, I don't think. 
you can watch these. It's interesting because you can like pin the corners and you can watch this thing shape, change shape as it's as it's shrinking and expanding. It's really really pretty cool. But that's that's it.